Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So let me start. Let me open uh, this afternoon session, which will be devoted to aerosol science. So the first speaker is Katja Luhaha, and she will be speaking on intact comparison of boundary layer and mixing layer uh, height from models and ground-based measurements. So please, what is yours? Thank you so much for the introduction. So I am Kajal Jalapa, a second year PhD student. And topic for my today's presentation is intercomparison of boundary layer and mixing layer height models versus ground-based measurements. Today's presentation is divided into three parts, introduction, methods, and results. But before going to the introduction, I would like to tell you why I wanted to do this study. The analysis models are the models which provide us global data sets on climate monitoring and research. They basically combine the forecast model data and the observational data together via data assimilation. They're also known as maps without gaps because they are globally complete and consistent in time. And they're also considered as relatively well data sets, particularly for the remote reasons, like where we don't have any ground-based measurements. But there are very less studies have been done on the reliability and accuracy of such models. So I take this as a responsibility on my little shoulders and started <laughs> this study. So in the Earth atmosphere, we have several layers like troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and so on. But there is one more layer that is atmospheric boundary layer. It is the lowest most part of the troposphere. Basically, it lies between the surface layer and the free atmosphere. And it also constrains all the particles emitted from the surface. The thickness of this layer varies from 300 meters to 3 kilometers, and this layer is highly influenced by the processes from the surface, such as turbulences, heat fluxes, and convections. The dynamic evolution of this layer is highly influenced by the solar radiation. When sun rises, this nighttime stable boundary layer burns off, and a convective boundary layer starts to grow. Within this layer, the particles from the residual layer starts to mix together through its depth. That is why it is also known as the mixing layer. As soon as sun sets, this nighttime stable boundary layer again forms and straightens itself, leaving behind the residual layer. So this is how it is also responsible for the vertical dispersion of the aerosols. And it will help me with my main PhD topic that is vertical distribution of black carbon aerosols. So why is it important to study this layer? Because when this layer is down, like lower in height, it retains all the particle movements. That is, the, it increases the particles near the surface, which leads to the several pollution events like haze, and which affects our health and our lives. This layer is also an important factor for calculating the Earth radiation budget, which is an input for the weather forecasting models. This layer also has ability to change the atmosphere near the surface because it retains the moment momentum transfer as well. So it leads to the climate change as well. So region of interest for our study is National Atmospheric Observatory of Koshikitse because here at this site, we have all the background information to support our study. At this site, we also have a tower to 50 meter long and where we are measuring several atmospheric level, uh, variables at several ele elevations. And this site represents a rural re background site because this site is affected by the regional and as well as the long range transported air masses. And the study year was 2020. For the ground-based measurements, we used Weizelas millimeter CL51. It is a LIDAR type remote sensing instrument, but Basically what it does, it sends a vertical laser into the sky, which is like near infrared range, that is 910 nanometer. And it uh, records the out, uh, intensity of the backscatters from the obstruction in the atmosphere, like clouds and aerosols, et cetera. It can detect three cloud layers simultaneously, and it also reports the vertical visibility. From the backscatter profiles, we again use to detect the boundary layer and the mixing layer height. For the reanalysis model data, we use two different models, that is ARA5 and high split. ARA5 
Insight is a fifth generation European weather forecasting model. It provides you several atmospheric, land, and oceanic variables on hourly, daily, and monthly basis. High Slate is a hybrid single particle Lagrangian integrated trajectory model. It is produced by NOAA Air Resource Laboratory. The main purpose of this model was to study the dispersion of the particles into the atmosphere. From the high split, we used three different data sets. First is reanalysis, which was available in six hour time resolution. And then we used GDAS, that is Global Data Assimilation System data set. This was available in three hour time resolution. Then we used GFS, Global Forecast System data set, and it was again available in the three hour time resolution. So finally, I would like to show you some of the initial results we have. Here in this plot, you will see the data from the ARA5 and the CELOMETER. Uh, the lines in the blue represents the boundary layer from the ARA5, and lines in the red represents the mixing layer height from the CELOMETER, and in the dark purple is the boundary layer height from the CELOMETER. So here you will see that the boundary layer from the ARA5 agrees very well with the mixing layer of the CELOMETER. So basically, uh, ARA5 doesn't provide us the boundary layer, but it provides us the evolution of the mixing layer. And here we also observe that the timings for the peaks was little different in the ARA5 than the CELOMETER. In the next plot, uh, we plot in high split ARA5 and CELOMETER all together. Uh, the lines in the pink is the reanalysis high split data, and you will see that it is underestimated throughout the year. So this high split reanalysis model is completely out of the league, no more in competition. So uh, this can be because it is available in six hour time resolution and the grid for this model is also different. But the lines in the green and the cyan is, all, is from GFS and GDAS. And they seem to agree very well with the ARA5. And some strange behaviors were also observed, like in the February, see, uh, the models overestimated their mixing their height. And during the summer months, you will see they underestimated the mixing their height. But during the winter months, like November, December, and January, they seem to agree very well with each other. So we run the linear regression model to know which model is related to our CELOMETER data more. So we find out that the error 5 is more related with the CELOMETER data with the R value of 0 0.7, followed by DDS and GFS, which was kind of strange because error 5 and GFS both runs on a same grid, that is 0 0.25, but DDS runs on the one degree grid. But then they were expected to have the same result, which is not in the case in our study. And here to you know the, how much is the underestimation and overestimation of the boundary layer. So here you see that during the summers, the mixing layer height is underestimated by 30 to 45 percent. But in the winter, it was agreed to relatively well. But this overestimation can be because of the February month, because we had some strange behavior, as I shown you. And then to know the physical explanation of such underestimated and overestimated values, we try to study some variables as a potential reasons. First, we try to read the temperature profiles, but temperature profiles from the, uh, all the models and from our site seems to agree very well with each other and they are with a slight difference. But uh, and the trend follows followed by was also very similar. So temperature cannot be the reason for that. Then we uh, try to see if our CELOMETER data is reliable or not. Then it is generally um, think that uh, the top of the mixing layer agrees very well with the height of the temperature inversion. So which was in our case. Like you can see the temperature inversions during the night, which agreed very well with our observational CELOMETER data. And the strange behavior here, here also can be seen, which was also seen in our CELOMETER data. So it proves the reliability of our CELOMETER data. Then the Richardson number. Richardson number is the number which is like calculated from the potential temperatures and the wind profiles at different heights. 
And this is known as that when this number reaches the critical value that is 0 0.25, then, then that height is considered as the boundary layer height or the mixing layer height. So for we took the data from the tower from the several levels and calculated the Richardson number from our side. In the black is the Richardson number from our side. And in the blue is the Richardson number from the error file. So here you see that our values agrees very well with each other because during the winters, this boundary layer is almost like 150 meters or 200 meters down during the night because we don't have, have enough heat fluxes during the winters. But with the error five data, they are seems to be very lower, which says that the environment is still turbulent and unstable. And it, it also opposes their values. So like, that's it. I would like to summarize what were the main findings. It was like error five measures the mixing layer height, not the boundary layer height. And more, models underestimated the mixing layer more in the summers than in the winters. And the lower Richardson error, error five uh, number says that the opposite its own observations basically and we are planning to study this Richardson number from the high split models as well and the more variables will also be studied like solar radiation and heat fluxes and um, that's all thank you for listening okay so it's time for questions please and Krishna, on the first, first slide, please spread it out. Yes. We are limited to the dimension that yeah. on this one. That for all, all the year, there is a good agreement between red and blue line, just, yeah. just the February exception. Uh, yes. it's strange, we have some because we have some from... cyclonic uh, synoptic situation during for the whole February month from this year. This was the main finding. And we are also planning to study the synoptic situations for this, like anticyclonic and cyclonic situations. So we can study the more effect of this. If models can catch the situations more or not. But what is strange is that it's all the, all the months. So we... It is like a little bit underestimated during the summers. As I said, it is underestimated by 35, 30 to 45%, but they seem to agree very well during the winters, like when it moves to the lower temperatures, it seems to agree very well with the model. And except the strange behavior, it was okay with the winters, but not in so the it's summer. Not specific situation probably. Yeah, it like it can say that during the summers these models are not reliable because they are not able to capture some variables. So but for the winters they are reliable. So what about uh, what about repeating this another year? Do you think we would yeah it can do like it can also be dependent on several other variables maybe like heat fluxes which mm -hmm. we are going to study mm -hmm. and it can also be dependent on synoptic situations mm -hmm. like pressure systems so it is yeah. still needed to be studied yeah maybe more data would be good yeah yeah like see whether it's permissible or not yeah it can be possible okay any other questions Remarks, no okay so Thank you once again. Thank you. And the next speaker is uh, Mr. Yiri Kovahi, uh, who will speak on vertical gradients of atmospheric, uh, atmospheric aerosols chemical composition. Mm -hmm. We will need to share the screen. Yes. Uh, 
Sound? No. Dobrý. Tohle? Dobrý, dobrý. Jenom dobrý, takhle, jo? Dobrý. Jo. So, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Let me talk you through my work a bit. For start, um, sorry, this presentation will be only theoretical. I just started my PhD recently, so hope it won't be boring too much for you. But uh, what's the chemical composition difference uh, between different heights? Uh, that's the basic question. A little bit of theoretical background. So what we want to study is a comparison of concentration and chemical composition at a 230 meter measurement platform and four to five meter above ground. And for that, we use this meteorological observatory tower in Košichice. And we want to know also the influence of atmospheric conditions, mainly height of the boundary layer, gradient of wind speed and direction, also the contribution of long range transport and correlation with daily and seasonal cycles depending mainly on temperature, atmospheric pressure, and relative humidity. And for that, we will uh, process data from different analytical methods, either direct continuous, such as AMS and ACSM. I will get to those later. Semi-continuous, which is pills followed by ion chromatography. And in direct methods, it's filtering of aerosol particles followed by ion chromatography. We compare data from two measuring sites. One is here at our institute, which is a reference urban site for the Czech Republic. And as I already mentioned, the atmospheric observatory in Košetice, which is a reference rural site, 250 meter tall tower. So, Regarding the direct continuous methods, we have the AMS stands for aerosol mass spectrometer and ACSM aerosol chemical speciation monitor, which is basically a simplified, lighter, cheaper version of the aerosol mass spectrometers. The difference mainly is that uh, AMS can do particle size distribution uh, and aerosol ACSM does not. So the RSO particles enter the setup uh, through this inlet here. Then they go through this aerodynamic lens that focuses the beam of the particles into this cell. And here they're ionized by a tungsten wire and vaporized by a hot plate and then go through the time of flight cells into the detector. Uh, both of them are currently deployed at Košetice measuring station, providing real, uh, near real time data. PILS stands for particle into liquid sampler, and uh, the device itself is very uh, simple. The RSO particles enter here, the setup through an inlet. Then there is a denuder. I will get to that a little bit later. Then they enter a cell where they are mixed with uh, vapor formed from ultra pure water, condensed and transferred into a liquid phase. Then they can be uh, either stored or analyzed right away with ion chromatography. They can be stored cool or frozen and then later on can be analyzed with various analytical methods. Uh, regarding these denuders, it's a tube with a inner porous coating that can be varied uh, for different purposes. The main uh, function of this part is to cut off an influence of chemical species in gas phase so that we measure really only the chemical composition in the aerosol particles. 
there can be, as I already said, uh, different coatings. Uh, some of them are to cut off uh, acidic gases, some of them to cut off base gases, basic, and also for organic trace gases. Then we have the, let's say, old school uh, analytical method for aerosol particles, that is filtering. The most common material of the filters is quartz fibers, but they can also be from cellulose, other polymers, and other materials. Uh, each of them have advantages and disadvantages. None of them is really universal for all, all kinds of uh, chemical species, but the most commonly used are the quartz fibers. A problem with the filters is uh, storage because the samples uh, undergo a degradation uh, with longer storage time. Uh, but they're still good as a reference method for comparison of the data from other analytical methods. And Yes, as I already said, <laughs> the, before following analytical methods, the filters are soaked into ultra pure water and then can be again stored dry and in cool environment or even be frozen. So to sum up, the aims of the projects are to investigate vertical gradient of concentration and chemical composition of atmospheric aerosols, and also on the way to compare accuracy and reliability of involved in used analytical methods, such as aerosol mass spectrometry, pills, and filtering of the aerosol particles, followed by ion chromatography, and I work under supervision of Jarda Schwartz. My consulting supervisors are Nadia Zikova and Petr Vodička, and our group leader is Vladež Dimal. Thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Okay, so we have plenty of time for discussion. That's good. Please. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, so uh, you like sum up uh, the methods what you will use probably, but uh, I don't get the aim. So you will investigate some aerosols, but why? Uh, because you in your research? yes, the, the research is based on comparison of the chemical composition between uh, the layer right above the surface is four meters and the height of two hundred thirty meters because they were there are recently some papers uh, starting popping up about uh, that that there is a difference of the chemical composition and also physical properties of the aerosol particles between these two heights and mainly because uh, of the height of the boundary layer, layer depending on meteorological conditions and season and daily uh, time uh, the boundary layer can be as low as the top of the tower. So we will basically measure the difference between the particle, the chemical composition of the particles in the boundary layer or in the higher altitude and to compare with the ground level. Okay, so this basically is something for return to be published in the literature. It's very recent, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Because there is not too much of these towers. Mm -hmm. Uh, on uh, uh, around the world, there are possibilities to use, for example, balloons mm -hmm. or drones. But drones usually cannot fly that high, and they are not stable. With the balloons, you release the balloon, it goes up. You have like one single campaign or measurement, mm -hmm. and then you can't do long term. Study. So here it will be continuous measurement yeah. for a long time period. Yes, so yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this tower has to be special somehow, or it can be, for example, in Liblitz or Kodibari, we have this radio towers 
can be used. Huh? There can be, yeah, yeah. It's just uh, about the collaboration uh, with the owner of the place and who built the tower. This is uh, shared mm -hmm. with uh, Czech Globe mm -hmm. uh, Group or Institute from Brno mm -hmm. and uh, Czech Hydrometeorological Institute. Mm -hmm. This is like a co joint project. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, involved, it's a part of the Actris uh, measurement uh, network. Mm -hmm. It stands for aerosol, clouds, and mm -hmm. trace gases research infrastructure. I was just wondering why you do you have to have this in Košitice? Whether this place is somehow special or? Yes, this place is special because it's almost in the middle of the Czech Republic. Uh -huh. And it's a rural site. There are no industry around, just a little bit of traffic. And no, the highway, I think. D1. Yes, yes, right. the highway is there, like 15 kilometers away. Uh -huh. So it provides a little bit of traffic emissions mm -hmm. that are almost everywhere in the Czech Republic. Right. But besides that, only agriculture and domestic heating, which mm -hmm. is also like representative for the whole, almost okay. the whole Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's a reference rural site mm -hmm. for these okay. measurements. Okay, are there any other questions? Please. Yeah. So if we still have time, uh, what are, are your expectations? Uh, so I think there are already some theoretical language studies, not experiments. So what do you think would be different in these uh, two layers? Yes, yes. So near to the ground uh, should be prevailing sources from domestic uh, heating. So either coal or biomass uh, combustion or gas uh, combustion. And in the higher layer, uh, more of a long term, uh, long distance transport uh, particles should be seen in the chemical composition. So, and those can be, uh, we can also compare there uh, with the uh, high split data like uh, Kajal was talking about. The, they can be traceable to uh, depending on the atmospheric uh, air uh, currents and streams. So then we can trace and do the source apportionment to uh, long distance uh, sources. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So it seems there are no other questions. So let's thank the speaker once again. Yeah, thank you. And the last speaker of this session will be uh, Lenka Suchankova, who will be present online. So probably we need to somehow switch it. Now I'm going to present the presentation. Can you share the screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> okay, can you see the presentation in the presenting yes. mode? Yes. yes, we can see it. Perfect, perfect. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. Uh, greetings from Lille, from northern France. Uh, and it's my pleasure to present to you today the chapter two of my aerosol light scattering property series in Kosciatice background site, but this one is not streamed on Netflix, so you'd rather pay attention. My name is Lenka Sukankova, and my supervisor is Dr. Vladimir Zdimal and Professor Ivan Holubek. Our agenda is quite tight today because I want to remind you what aerosol optical properties are and what are aerosol effects on climate. I want to recapitulate some results I've obtained uh, last year, mainly about temporal variability, and to bring some spice, some sparkling in it. I'm really interested to, sh uh, to share you my results, mainly about the effect of meteorology, other gaseous pollutants, and uh, aerosol size distribution on light scattering properties. If I remember correctly, last year I asked you if you know what aerosols are, so I assume you already know it. Aerosols are suspended liquid or solid particles in the gas, which can have a variety of properties. Just let's, let's look at the size. We are talking about five to six orders of magnitude. 
aerosols can have different shape, different origin and chemical composition, and also different concentration. And all of these factors mixed up together can come up with uh, very specific and unique properties to living organisms, but also to the environment itself. And today we'll be talking about aerosols and their effect on climate. And my research is mainly focused on the direct effect of aerosols on the climate. Let's say that the concentration of aerosols in the atmosphere is not negligible. Thus, we can observe direct effect, which consists of scattering of light on a particle in any angle and of absorption of light by aerosols. Scattering is mainly cooling and have cooling effect of, of climate, whereas the absorption has warming effect on the climate. But to sum it up, scattering is a major part of direct effect, and thus direct effect is cooling. And then we also know indirect effect consisting of two of them, and they, deals, they deal with aerosol cloud interactions and how clouds are adjusted based on the concentration of aerosols. If we, if we are talking globally, aerosols cool the climate and can compete with greenhouse gases and slow global warming. However, due to their temporal and spatial variability, they are still one of the biggest uncertainties in climate model estimations. And that it, thus it's very important to study a long-term period and to observe them, observe their behavior and how they vary in time. And thus we are very interested and we're very interested into the characterization of long-term variability of light scattering properties at uh, Koshekitsa atmospheric site. But also, I really wanted to see some correlation between uh, gaseous precursors and other chemical pollutants, uh, atmospherical pollutants, on the light scattering properties, as well as the effect of meteorology and the other physical properties of aerosols. Um, I think you've seen this uh, a lot of time today as well as yesterday. So these are Koshekice, our atmospheric side, and very interesting because of our 250 meters tall tower, which I, by the way, miss really a lot because here in France, we have, we have only roof and like it's not the height I prefer. Uh, but here in Koshekice, we sampled from four meters above the ground and we use integrated nephilometer. It's a really easy instrument which basically operates uh, like we illuminate the particle, the particle scatter the light, and the light is scattered and detected by the detector at three different wavelengths, blue, green, and red. We obtain scattering coefficient which provide us the information about the ability of particle to scatter in any angle and then the backscattering coefficient which provides us information about scattering in more than 90 degrees so back to the source of the light. From these we can calculate other climate relevant variables and thus have like wider uh, wider insight in what direct cooling effect of aerosols and climate are. So here are these climate relevant variables. First of all, scattering action exponent, which can identify particle size dependence on wavelength of light. So we can adjust the size of particle based on their interaction with the light. And we have hemispheric backscattering ratio B and asymmetry factor G. Both of them helps us estimate the cooling effect of aerosols. For B, zero means no backscattering, one means complete backscattering, and asymmetry factor G is more connected to the phase function and ranges from minus one for backscattering to plus one to total for scattering. Now let's check some annual variation. In the first two graphs, you can see total scattering and backscattering coefficient variation from 2012 to 2019. And as you can see, we observe decreasing trend, which correlated with overall decreasing concentration of PM10 and PM2.5 in these years. So we expect the concentration of aerosols uh, is decreasing over the time. In the graph C, there is SAE angstrom exponent, which is also decreasing, but that suggests us that the size of particles is increasing during this time. 
And in the last two graphs, you can see increasing backscattering ratio B and decreasing asymmetry factor G, which implies that even if we have lower loading of aerosols in the atmosphere in Kosciatice, the cooling effect, the cooling potential of aerosols is increasing during this time. Let's check the seasonal variation. In the first graph, you can see increased total scattering coefficient in winter, the purple color, which could be caused by higher aerosol concentration because of worse dispersion and lower planetary boundary layer during winter. In the second graph, you can see G asymmetry factor decreasing in summer, which implies that there is more pulling potential in summer comparing to winter where it increases. And this is mainly caused by the presence of carbonaceous aerosols from the residential heating, which are mainly absorbers. And then we have second, uh, sorry, then we have angstrom exponent increasing in summer, indicating smaller particles, implying secondary organic aerosol formation during this time, and decreasing exponent in winter, indicating, on the other hand, aerosol aging and higher atmospheric stability during winter. What about other atmospheric pollutants? In the first graph, uh, there is really nice correlation between total scattering and backscattering coefficients at the blue, uh, sorry, the green wavelength of light and uh, the lines of SO2 and NOx, which are precursors for sulfates and nitrates, which are mainly scatterers when they are presented in, uh, in the aerosol. So you really can see that any peak uh, peaks in uh, uh, and the peaks really nicely correlate with each other. I also discussed secondary organic aerosol formation, and thus I also check the concentration of isoprene during this time at Kosciatice. You can see it in the second graph, and as you can see, the increased concentration is mainly in summer, which we uh, also predicted. And to even more support the hypothesis with secondary organic aerosol formation, in the last graph, which I uh, obtained from a data from OCC analyzer, the, the black line shows us the ratio between secondary organic carbon to the total organic carbon. So again, secondary organic formation is increased during summer. Now let's check some meteorology, and we'll start with uh, fog. As I, uh, as as we check the influence of fog on the light scattering, and we define the fog as the visibility up to one kilometer. In the right, uh, in the right graph, you can see backscattering coefficient. In the left graph, sorry, in the left graph there is backscattering coefficient. In the right graph there is backscattering ratio. Uh, in three different wavelengths. The first one of pair is always made from a uh, data without fog, and the second one is also with fog. So what can we see here? We can see increased backscattering coefficient during foggy events, and I observed that also during uh, for the total scattering coefficient. So we have more scattering during foggy events. However, when we check backscattering ratio, we can see that backscattering ratio is smaller during fog events. It means that particles cool the atmosphere more or less than uh, during non-fog events. And there we have hypothesis about multiple scattering of light in uh, this population of fog particles because they have a specific size. They are large in size. Also, their concentration is a bit uh, different. And because this wasn't really intuitive for me and it was a surprise for me, I called it phenomenon of warming fog. Then we check also the cloud cover and their and the influence on light scattering. Uh, we worked with the definition from WA, uh, WMO 2022, where we div uh, divided days to four categories, fine days, partly cloud days, cloud days, and overcast days. Uh, in the first graph, there is total scattering coefficient, then backscattering coefficient, and in the third one, there is backscattering ratio. As you can see, we observe, again, increase of scattering and backscattering, mainly in uh, overcast and fine days compared to cloud uh, and partly cloudy days. But again, we observe lower cooling potential during days when scattering was bigger. 
uh, and we assume that during the five day, fine days, there is higher solar activity, which is connected to secondary organic formation again. And for overcast days, there is hypothesis of increased relative humidity and thus possible hygroscop hygroscopic changes in the structure of particles. Last but not least, uh, the influence of physical parameters, concentration, mass, surface, or volume on scattering properties. I plotted all of these and correlate these with uh, different modes of particles, and the strongest positive correlation with scattering was observed for particles in between 200 and 800 nanometers. It's because this size is near to the visible wavelength of light, and these particles interact with these wavelengths the most. Particles under 100 nanometer, however, fall into so-called Rayleigh scattering regime. It means that they are operated under different uh, regime and different physical laws than the particles in the visible wavelength of light, which are uh, lead by me scattering regime. And before I want to thank you for your attention, I want to impress you and I want to share with you how lucky I was when I was, uh, when I was at the right time at the same place. This video, I hope you can see it and it's not really uh, messy, uh, was taken at our atmospheric station after, after the the storm and you know there is a saying that under the rainbow there is wealth so now we know that the wealth is in Koshetice <laughs> because we need a wealth so thanks a lot and don't hesitate to ask questions thank you very nice so talk now let's come to the session so this question so I'm sorry I can't I can't hear you properly Okay, so there is one question now. Uh, thank you for your excellent talk. Uh, can you please go back to your recent first slide with the experimental results, please? I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I, I don't understand. Yeah. Could the, the, the yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, so uh, can you please go back uh, to your, I think it was the first slide with the experimental results, please? Yeah, you mean the annual variation? Um, this one? No, no, no. No. The very first one. The very, very first one. No, I mean, I'm sorry. I will, I mean the first one with uh, experimental results. Yeah, it's this. Yes, yeah. results with annual oh, variation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So if we look on the very left hand side picture uh, we can see that the error bars are quite large and the tendency let's say it's not uh, somehow very much expressed so do you think it does make sense to say then that the trend is decreasing well i i tested it with uh, statistical tests and uh, the trend was statistically significant uh-huh okay thank you welcome Okay, are there any other questions, remarks or comments? Yes. It seems it's not the case, so thank you once again. Thanks a lot.